All right, we are going to be looking at Revelation chapter 13. The title of this morning's message is Babylon and the New World Order. Take a look at Revelation 13, verses 1 through 4. Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. And on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? So as we begin, it's important to understand that Revelation chapters 11, 12, and 13 mark the midpoint of the seven-year tribulation, also known as Daniel's 70th week. We are at the event known as the abomination of desolation. The Antichrist sits in the rebuilt temple in Jerusalem, and he declares himself to be God. This is a prophecy. This is something the Bible says will happen in the future. Jesus talks about this in the Olivet Discourse of Matthew chapter 24. The Apostle Paul spoke of it in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and I'd like to read that section. 2 Thessalonians 2 verses 1 through 4, Paul says, Now brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Listen now, he says, Let no one deceive you by any means. For that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed. This is the one we call the Antichrist, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So the Antichrist will rise to power during the first three and a half years. And then the final three and a half years, or 42 months, is basically when he rules the world as the uh, dictator from hell. Uh, we see this in Revelation 13, verse 5. He was given a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for 42 months, which is three and a half years. So this is where things get real. And I say that because there is a clear movement in the world today that seeks to bring all nations together and eventually all religions together and all economic systems together. Uh, globalism, the United Nations, uh, also an attack on what is called nationalism and borders. We hear about uh, globalism, and this is all leading us to a one world government. It may be in the near future, it may be in the distant future, but also consider there's ecumenicalism along with the interfaith movement. What is this doing? Preparing the way, trying to bring all religions together. So there's a movement to bring all nations together. There's a movement to bring all religions together to where the Pope on the Catholic side, and this is true, you can just go search this on the internet. It wouldn't be hard to find the videos. The Pope on the Catholic side and even uh, Billy Graham on the Protestant side uh, have both stated on record that all religions can get you to God. Uh, the Church of Jesus Christ needs to wake up and realize what's happening, what's happening right uh, in our own generation. It's happening right before our eyes. The groundwork is being laid for what is to come, and Satan, or the dragon, has been working on this plan for a long, long time. You know, I suspect that the devil, through every generation, has had his candidate or candidates uh, for the Antichrist. It's a matter of God restraining him, but when that restraint is lifted, uh, this is going to happen, and it's going to happen fast. 
So this will be the outline for the message from Revelation 13, a one world government, that's verses 1 through 10, a one world religion, that's verses 11 through 15, and then finally a one world economy, that's verses 16 through 18. So the Antichrist, also called the beast, in chapter 13, will rule over this one world government, which is later called Babylon, and religiously, Mystery Babylon. Now, before we continue, I'd like you to turn to the uh, book of Acts, Acts chapter 17, because I want to make something clear. I used a few terms, uh, globalism and nationalism, and these are relevant terms we hear a lot about these days. So what does the Bible teach? Does the Bible want, uh, or does the Bible teach that all people, all nations should come together as a one world community? Is that what the, uh, the Bible teaches or does it teach separate nations? Well take a look at Acts 17 verse 26. It says that God has made from one blood. Okay, there's, there's not multiple races. There's not the white race and the black race and the Arab race and the Asians. and no, we're, we're, we're one people. There's only one race, the human race. We're all from one blood. That's what he says, that God has made us from one blood. He has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth. And he has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries, or the borders, if you will, of their dwellings. So separate nations with boundaries or borders, this is what the Lord wants. Uh, globalism, or certainly a one world government, is not what the Lord wants. And why does the Lord want it this way? Why does he want boundaries? Well, look at Acts 17, uh, again, verse 26, and then verse 27, that he, that is God, has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwelling, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. And now turn to Genesis chapter 11. Genesis chapter 11. Uh, this is the account of the Tower of Babel. Uh, after the flood, uh, Noah was told by the Lord, Noah and his sons, be fruitful and multiply uh, and fill the earth. This is what God wanted mankind to do. Increase in number, multiply, and fill the earth. Spread out and cover the whole world. But as usually happens, uh, God says one thing, and mankind decides to do uh, the exact opposite. And look at Genesis 11, starting in verse 1. Now the whole world had one language and one speech. So they were all together. <clears throat> and it came to pass... Uh, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build a, a city for ourselves, and a tower whose top is in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth, which is what the Lord told them to do. So was God pleased at this one world community? They had one language, they're all together. This made the Lord happy, right? Wrong. Verse 5, But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language. And this is what they begin uh, to do, that now nothing that they do or nothing they propose will be withheld from them. And notice what the Lord says here, Come, let us go down there. So the Lord is referring to himself in plural form, which uh, we know is a reference uh, to the Trinity. Come, let us go down there and confuse their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore its name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all 
the earth. So mankind had one language, the people were united, but here's the problem, they were united in their rebellion against God. And in the end times, the Antichrist is going to have his kingdom, Babylon, a one world system, and it's going to be united against the Lord Jesus Christ, against God. The Antichrist, after all, is anti-Christ. So a few things to point out. This is the concept, the beginning of the concept of Babylon here in Genesis 11. Babel becomes Babylon. Babylon becomes a world empire. And that same spirit that was in Babylon has been transferred to Rome in Revelation 17 because uh, Babylon and then mystery Babylon, so there's the government part, and then there's the religion part, the Babylonian mystery religion. It's located uh, in Rome, the city on seven hills. You can see that in Revelation 17 verse 9. So that spirit of false religion is transferred from Babylon to Rome. So you have Babel, Babylon, the world empire. That spirit is transferred to Rome, which has uh, many of the things from the Babylonian mystery religion, the queen of heaven, etc. And you know, there's, there's a contrast in the book of Revelation. There is the true religion, the false religion. The true church, uh, the false church. There's the bride of Christ arrayed in pure white and then there is the harlot or the whore of Babylon as Revelation uh, 17 talks about in the King James Version of the Bible. So the point is a one world system They've already tried that. In Genesis 11, the Lord confounded their language. Uh, the devil's going to try it again. And this one world system has never been God's will. So we see that in the first book of the Bible, Genesis. We see it in the last book of the Bible, Revelation. So this is a, a common theme. You know, God is always at work. Amen. Well, unfortunately, the devil is always at work. Now, turn back to Revelation chapter 13. So point number one is the devil's plan or the dragon's plan for a one world government. Verse one, the Bible reads, Revelation 13, verse one, then I stood on the sand of the sea. And some translations say that it is the dragon who stands on the sand of the sea. And we'll see why that may be important in a moment. But I saw a beast rising up out of the sea. So this is a beast, a ferocious animal, a monster. And there is symbolism in that the beast has seven heads and ten horns. And on his horns, ten crowns, and on his heads, a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear. His mouth, the mouth, like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. Now when compared to verses from the book of Daniel, uh, and verses elsewhere in Revelation, we see that the seven heads are likely a reference to the seven world empires uh, in biblical history. There is Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and then what we believe will be a revival of the Roman Empire. So the Antichrist uh, appears, or the little horn, appears to come out of a, a coalition of ten kings, or ten nations. And again, we get this from the book of Daniel, I believe chapter 7. So in the end times, this world ruler, the beast, or the Antichrist, he ascends to power, and he is either indwelt by, or at the very least, uh, empowered by the devil. Look at verse 3, or the dragon as he's called. Verse 3, and I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded. Now, it didn't say it is mortally wounded. It said as if it had been mortally wounded. So his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled. I mean, they're standing in wonder. And they followed the beast. So this would indicate that there is most likely a, a false resurrection event. So the beast will appear to have died. Maybe he really will have died and then is brought back to life by the spirit of Satan himself. That's possible. But at least he will to have uh, appear to have died and then his deadly wound will be healed. And it's like, well, he rose from the dead. He must be, he must be Christ. He must be God. And after all, the Antichrist is, is, he is a false Christ. He's an imitation. He's, he's an imposter. 
So Jesus rose from the dead. The Antichrist appears to have risen from the dead. Jesus had his prophet to pave the way, John the Baptist, the Antichrist will have his false prophet. Jesus could perform miracles and signs and wonders. The beast will have his lying signs and wonders. Jesus had a ministry of how long? Three and a half years. Well, the beast will be given authority to continue for 42 months or three and a half years. Now look at verses three and four. So they worship the dragon who gave authority to the beast and they worship the beast saying, who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And he was given a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue for 42 months. Also, Jesus had God the Father. Well, the beast will have his father, the devil. Jesus was worshipped as God. The Antichrist will be worshipped as God. There is the Holy Trinity of Father, Son, and Spirit. Then there is the Satanic Trinity the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. And we will read about him, uh, make reference to him a little later on. But going back to Revelation 13, verse 1, you know, if it is the dragon who's standing on the sand of the sea, uh, pastor and Bible teacher John MacArthur says this, that this is Satan taking his position in the midst of the nations uh, of the world, represented by the sand of the sea. The sea represents the abyss or the pit, the haunt of demons. So this would be a picture of Satan summoning a powerful demon from the abyss who then activates and controls the beast and his empire. So at this point, if the beast has authority over the entire earth, and then he comes back from the dead. So, you know, something happens to him. Someone maybe tries to assassinate him. And then he comes back from the dead. It's no surprise that the whole world will marvel. They will stand in wonder. And back in Revelation 11, verse 7, the beast is able to do what no man has ever done before. Uh, for three and a half years, the two witnesses minister and basically the people of the earth they hate the two witnesses uh, the two witnesses torment the people of the earth and no man can touch them no man can kill them but the beast is allowed to kill them so the beast kills the two witnesses he does what no man could do and that results in the world saying who is like the beast who is able to make war with him he was able to kill the two witnesses we've been trying to do that for three and a half years but the beast did it, we will follow him. He is the savior of the world. And of course, he claims to be God. And he has his false miracles that seem to confirm that. So the people will believe the Antichrist. Uh, Jesus came unto his own. His own did not receive him. But the people will believe the Antichrist. Jesus said in John chapter 5, verse 43, I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. So this is the pattern of human history, is it not? You know, God speaks the truth. Man chooses to believe the lie. The Lord gives the Ten Commandments. Mankind breaks the Ten Commandments. God sends Christ. The world rejects Christ. Uh, Satan provides the Antichrist. <clears throat> the Antichrist is embraced. Look at verses 6 and 7. Then he opened his mouth and blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. And it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given to him over every tribe, every tongue, and every nation. So this is your one world government because the Antichrist has authority over all the nations. Look at verse 8, in all who dwell on the earth, and that's a phrase that's pointed at or referring to unbelievers, they will do what? They will worship him. They will worship him. And then we see this interesting statement about those who worship the beast, that their names have not been written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. You see, the Lord knows his people, and the Lord will protect his people. He knows 
uh, who belongs to him. And he has written their names in the Lamb's book of life from the foundation of the world. What does Ephesians 1, 4, and 5 tell us? That God has chosen us in Christ from before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him, in love having predestined us to the adoption of sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. So the point is no true believer will ever worship the Antichrist. No true believer will ever take the mark of the beast. That is one thing that we do not have to worry about. Oh, the world will follow the Antichrist. The world, they'll take the mark. A true believer will not. And Jesus himself uh, warned us about how false Christ will rise up and they will show great signs and wonders that if possible, even to deceive the very elect. Of course, thank the Lord, that is not possible. So God will preserve the salvation of his own. <clears throat> and then John goes on to write, If anyone has an ear, let him hear. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. And he who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. So in the last days, all authority is given to the beast over every nation, tribe, and tongue. That is the dragon's plan for a one world government. Now point number two, the dragon's plan for a one world religion. In Revelation 13 verse 11, then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth and he had two horns like a lamb, but he spoke like a dragon. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And he performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. And he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed." So you have here a one world religion in that all people of the earth will worship this man, the Antichrist. And as I've said before, we identify the first beast as the Antichrist and then the second beast, uh, he is known as the false prophet. He's mentioned in Revelation 16 verse 13. Revelation 19, verse 20, and Revelation 20, verse 10, they all talk about the beast and the false prophet. So what is the role of the false prophet? Well, again, Jesus had his prophet, John the Baptist, who prepared the way, uh, make uh, straight the paths of the Lord, and he directed people to worship Jesus. You know, uh, he must increase, I must decrease. Don't worship me, don't follow me, follow him. Worship him. And that's what the false prophet is going to do. He is going to direct people to worship the Antichrist. He even makes an image of the beast. And this image has the appearance as if it's alive. And it can speak. And some have suggested that this, this image is an, an idol, like a carved image. Uh, but with modern technology, it wouldn't be difficult to imagine that it had the ability to talk. Uh, some uh, theorize that it could be a, a hologram. You know, we don't really know. We don't really know what it is. We don't know what the mark of the beast will be. We'll talk about that in a moment. But here is the point. It doesn't matter necessarily for us what it is. People who are living during the end times, they will know. At least the redeemed of God will be able to recognize that's the Antichrist, that's the image, that's the mark. Okay, so we might not know, but this is for the people living in that time period. So they will know. So there is this one world religion, and it's going to be established 
and the object of its worship will be the beast or the Antichrist. And again, he sits in the temple of God declaring himself that he is God. Now, here's the challenge. Here's the question people will ask, and it's a good question. It's a reasonable question. How can a man bring all religions together? How is that possible? Well, there is a motivating factor. You do realize that. <laughs> uh, few things. First of all, uh, the beast, he has ultimate political power. Uh, he's going to be an impressive figure. There's no question about that. Uh, there is also satanic deception going on. There's false miracles, a false resurrection event, or maybe an actual resurrection. We're not exactly sure. Uh, so no doubt the false prophet, when he talks about the beast, he's going to tell people what they're inclined to believe and what they want to hear. That's what all uh, false prophets do. And you know, if all of that doesn't work, there's one thing that will seal the deal. What is that? You either worship the Antichrist or you will be beheaded. You either worship the beast or die. And the Bible says that the fearful or the cowardly uh, will be cast into the lake of fire. So even if you don't want to believe, these people don't believe in God. These are the people of the earth who have rejected the true God. They've rejected Christ. Uh, God for his people, he has not given us a spirit of fear, but Satan, according to Hebrews 2, controls the people of this world through the fear of death. So the Antichrist, when he says, either worship me or die, the people of this earth will be cowardly. They won't stand up for him. They've rejected the true God. They rejected the spirit of God. They will try to preserve their own lives, which is what you would probably expect. They will be fearful, even if they don't want to give in and worship the image and take the mark and bow to the Antichrist. They will do it. Of course, most of the world will be happy to do it because the Antichrist is going to come on the scene at a time which will be there'll be warfare and pestilence and disease. And he's going to be the guy who appears to have all the answers. He's going to uh, be able to solve the world's problems, or so he says. So the threat of death can be a real uh, motivator. Of course, this is why true believers in Christ, during the tribulation, this is why they will be persecuted and many will die because they refuse to take the mark, they refuse to bend the knee. And I suspect that the beast, here's my theory on how he's going to bring all religions together. Uh, he will probably allow all religions to keep their traditions, uh, their headscarves, their incense, their idols, their temples, uh, all of those. They keep doing what you're doing. There's just one thing I want to add, one requirement, that's all. Either worship me, or he'll say, worship me, most will do it. And the ones who don't want to do it, well, either worship me or die. And again, uh, that will be a real motivator. So I suspect that's how he's going to do it. Keep doing your religion. You have practice your religion. I'm just going to have one request. <laughs> just one, one little thing, right? And consider that many religions are very open in adding new beliefs. Uh, it's called liberalism. It exists within every religion. And also consider that just about every religion, they have, they have a place, uh, they have an opening for, or they are looking forward to the coming of a, a person. So this man, the Antichrist, there's a place for him in just about every religion. Let me explain. The Jews don't believe in Jesus, right? So the Jews, in their mind, they're still looking for the Messiah. They are waiting for the Christ. Now the true Christ already came, they rejected him, but they're waiting for their Christ and they'll get him, the Antichrist, okay? So uh, that's the Jewish religion. Of course, the Islamic religion, they have their Messiah figure, the Mahdi or the 12th Imam. Catholicism, of course, has the papacy where the Pope is considered to be Christ on earth. He is the vicar of Christ, the Holy Father. <clears throat> uh, Buddhism and Hinduism, by the way, the term antichrist doesn't just mean you're against Christ. 
It means you're a, an imitation of Christ, one who stands in the place of Christ, and that's what vicar of Christ means. Uh, Buddhism and Hinduism teaches reincarnation, so any of their religion, he could say, I'm the Buddha reincarnated, and that would fit within their system. So all the world religions have a place for this man, and he will appeal to all. No doubt he will be a charismatic figure. And again, if it were possible, he would even deceive Christians, but that's not possible because of eternal security. God protects and preserves his own. So the Antichrist will likely attempt uh, to use a biblical phrase to be all things to all men. And he will be successful at it. Of course, the Lord's going to eventually cast him into the lake of fire where he'll be tormented day and night forever and ever, but he will have his time period upon the earth. And of course, the earth will be in a state of chaos. Again, warfare, pestilence, disease. So he will be welcomed as the man poised to solve all the world's problems. You know, that's, this is what the world is looking for. The world is looking, see, Christians are looking for the Christ. <clears throat> the world, whether they know it or not, they're looking for their Savior, who will be the Antichrist. Now, uh, one major problem will almost certainly <clears throat> exist at this time period of the tribulation. What's this problem? Uh, what is this thing that's going to be on people's mind? It's always on people's minds. The economy. Money. This is what drives the world. Lust and greed. <clears throat> so everyone's always thinking about money and the economy. And this leads us to point number three. Point number one, the dragon's plan for a one world government. Point number two, the dragon's plan for a one world religion. And now point number three, the dragon's plan for a one world economy. Take a look at verse 16. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, slave and free, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. So the number of 666 is very well known. And people often identify it with the devil, which is understandable. But notice what the scripture says. It is the number of a man. So in the scripture, seven is the number of God. And seven represents perfection, completeness, but the number of man is six, so man falls short, right? So what is 666? What does that mean? Well, the bottom line is we don't, we don't really know. But when these things happen, there will be some way to identify the beast with this number. But the point is, nobody will be able to do business. Nobody will be able to buy or sell. You won't be able to shop. They won't allow you into the grocery stores. You won't be able to, you know, get your medication. They won't allow you to do just, just about anything. You need the mark of the beast. And if you don't take the mark, what are they going to do? They're going to, the Antichrist will kill you. So you're not going to be able to buy or sell. And considering we're moving towards a cashless society, I mean, I never have any cash on me. Most people don't even uh, carry cash anymore. You know, if a mugger tries to rob me, he's going to be pretty disappointed. Uh, but you can understand if we're moving towards a cashless society, it would be very simple for a government to control all of this. You have the mark or you don't have the mark. You can't get in, you scan it, and hey, this is very possible. Even now with the technology we have, it's very possible. We can see how this could take place. So the government could control this, the means of production and distribution, buying, selling of food, uh, medicine, merchandise, etc. So in conclusion, uh, what's the takeaway? Right? What's the takeaway? Just to give you a detailed description of the end times? Well, that would be valuable enough, but no, that's not the main concern on my heart, uh, not really, because the odds are, whether it's uh, uh, the rapture of the church or uh, whether it's just the timing of all this, you know, we might not even be here for this. 
So uh, if we're not here for this, then why worry about it? That's probably the, the thought someone might have. Well, you might be here. That's, that's another thing. And you, you want to know these things. But number one, all scripture is profitable for doctrine. So these are important truths one way or another. Uh, but point number two, my immediate concern here is that many professing Christians are starting to buy into exactly what the Bible warns us against. Whether you call it statism or socialism or globalism, the world coming together under one banner, you know, a rejection of borders and nation states, you hear about multiculturalism, a, a world community. Instead of independent nations, we just have a, a coming together, a part of a one world <clears throat> system. You know, it, it sounds so good to people. It sounds so appealing to people, but you know what it is? It's really just Babylon all over again. And what's the Lord's response? Revelation 18, verse 4. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word. And we thank you that you preserve your people. Lord, if someone has trusted in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, if they have believed that Jesus died on the cross uh, for their sins and rose again the third day, if they have called upon the name of the Lord, uh, there is a promise for them that they shall be saved. And they are not appointed to wrath. Lord, your people are not appointed to wrath, but wrath is coming. And I just pray if somebody does not know Christ, they are trust in him today to be delivered from this horrific hour that is coming upon the earth. And Lord, let no one say that, well, this isn't possible. Oh, it's possible. And it's coming. And every day, it's one day closer. But the good news for us is that every day, the coming of Jesus Christ is one day closer. And he will establish a kingdom upon this earth, a kingdom of righteousness, as we pray in the Lord's Prayer, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray all these things in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen.